Right. Yes, I was like, I recognize your face. Are you good? Good. Yeah. Yeah. I love she the trainer. So far in the couple of students. Yeah. So we do uh, this one in the summer. I always do one sort of the second or third week of January. Thank you. 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 Thank Song, right? So we'll see. That's my attitude. I'm like, what's the biggest flex that you have? Know? <laughs> I think we're going to be somebody's going to rise and run up, but you know what? It's even people with my sister. I'm going to be good. 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 Yeah. Again, I was like, oh. yeah. I, mean, I just realized how 
But I'm excited. I'm excited. Yes. It's always Yeah, I 
Give folks just another minute and we'll get rolling. Okay, welcome. Uh, my name is Lindsay Mason. I work here in this building as the director of off-campus life, and I use she, her pronouns. Um, I first want to start with that I'm a little nervous. I have only ever given this presentation one other time, and so I am a snow butterflies right now. And so I am um, not just like welcoming, but I would be incredibly appreciative for any feedback that you have. It is important to me that this workshop is as useful as possible for folks. And so I just kind of really welcome feedback because we're so new uh, at this topic. Um, I will be looking at notes. Uh, there are certain things I'm even going to read it for them to like keep them on time. Um, so yeah, we'll, I will be looking at this throughout the presentation. Additionally, it's being recorded. That's why there's this extra laptop here for just letting folks know there is a recording happening. Um, Okay, I'm curious, has anyone in here ever trained for some type of a long run? You know, it doesn't have to, have to be a marathon. Has anyone here ever trained for a long run? Okay, you should be talking about what your training experience was like. Like, what, what were, what was part of your training experience? It was brutal. It was brutal. Okay. Slow. Slow? Okay. What were some things that you had to think about for? What you were eating or drinking, like along the ones to keep yourself happy. I was listening to my body. I didn't know I was able to take a break. There was like lots of stress that made me. Interesting. So it was going to be. So I hear you one that you were like going longer and longer and longer, like you were making progress. And then I also hear you, if, if I understand you correctly, like it was hard, like you would feel it at times, like I am pushing myself, this is difficult. That makes sense. Uh, the other one that I've heard people mention at times is like clothes. Like what am I, like what am I wearing? What are like good shoes for me? What are good shorts that don't ride up for me? Like, um, okay, I asked that question because the workshop today is about deep, meaningful work. And I'm going to assume that many of us in the room have had experiences where maybe we're behind on work or we've got a big project or whatever that is. And we are like, I just need to sit down, shut my door for three hours, and I just need to crank out some work. Joe Newport, which is the author work that we talking about today, he argues that you can't just sit down and just do deep work for three hours out of nowhere, that you have to train for it. The same way that you have to train for a marathon. You have to get yourself up to capacity or to have the ability to really concentrate for long periods of time. So I'm going to come back to that marathon analogy a little bit. Um, yeah, throughout the workshop. Okay, so um, okay. So for today's workshop, I'm going to do a quick introduction. Uh, I have some stories that I want to share about how I got here. Then I have some lessons and practices from the books that I'd like to share. And then um, there's going to be group discussion kind of throughout. Um, yeah. Okay. So today we're talking about deep, meaningful work. And, and I'll introduce Cal Newport more here in a second. But Cal Newport, he defines, he, he likes to go over the difference between shallow work and deep work. 
he argues that shallow work is non cognitively demanding logistical style tasks that are often performed while distracted or can be performed while distracted. They, they need to be done, but they may not, they, they don't create much new value in the world, and they're easy to replicate and easy to train someone else to do. He argues that deep work is the opposite of that, or specifically the type of work that optimizes your performance. So for me, in my world, I sign a lot of financial documents on behalf of my office. That's work that has to get done. The finances have to be reviewed and processed, no doubt. But that's something I could train someone on. And it is something that I can review documents, talk to someone, come back, review documents. I can do it while distracted. Or I have to approve time clocks. That has to happen. People have to get paid. We have to process time clocks. But it's not something that like requires deep thought on my behalf or something that you know has to be really um, where I have to shut the door and people do it. So both of those things need to get done. But I can train someone else to do them. But an example of maybe what deep work looks like for me, it's something that improves my me or my team's performance or provides a significant value to CSU students. That's what I think about. Like, how am I improving the performance of those that I'm serving? How am I providing significant value to them? So maybe it's um, streamlining our accounting processes to be more automatic or at least faster so it takes less time. Or um, I'm working on a safe parking lot right now for students or staff that are seeking shelter in their vehicles. That's not something I can just train someone else to do. That's work that I'm putting in every day and building knowledge around. Um, and, and so that's deep work that will provide significant value to someone else. Okay. We are all distracted. <laughs> all right. If y'all are willing to participate by show of hands, I have a set of questions. Um, that will hopefully show us that many of us experience distractions. A lot of this workshop today is going to be focused on how many of us are addicted to screens. This could be our phone, our tablets, our computers, our TVs, whatever it is. Some of you might be thinking, you know, I don't actually feel attached to my phone. I actually have a really good boundary with my phone. And if so, I look forward to your feedback throughout this workshop. <laughs> I've also, when I was when I was prepping this workshop, some people they would be very specific about like, oh, that's Gen Z. I'm like, how do you think it's intergenerational? I think like all of us are experiencing this. Um, in my anecdotal experience, I think that most people across multiple generations are more attacked, distracted by, or reliant on their screens than they want to be. All right, by show of hands. If you have your phone sitting next to you, who in here has looked at your phone simply because you haven't heard it ding in a while? You just want to make sure you didn't miss something. <laughs> yep. Okay, or my laughs. That's good. That's a high five. Who wears headphones or listens to, to listen to music or podcasts during times that you're alone? Like you're walking, you're on the bus, you're doing chores. Yep. Who if you're eating alone, passing something up on their phone? Or what they want something to watch or engage in while they're eating. Who looks at their phones while they're waiting for something or are in a transition time? Like you're waiting in line or you're sitting on the bus or you're sitting in a drive through Who looks at multiple screens at a time? Like who has a TV on in the background and looking at their screen? It's camera. Who looks at their phone if they can't fall asleep or as they fall asleep? Who multitasks during a Zoom meeting? Mm -hmm. email. Okay. Well, if I'd asked this question a couple years ago, people would not have been willing to attend it, but I don't think people can now. Who takes their phone with them to the bathroom? Yep. Okay, so I don't wear a smart, I don't wear a smartwatch to have like notifications. So I haven't experienced this, but during my last time, someone asked me this: Who feels ghost notifications on their watch on their phone? Like, the answer is like you think your your watch is like buzzing, but it's not. Are there any other times, if willing, if people are willing to share, are there any other times in your life where you feel yourself seeking distraction? Like one for me, and I don't know if this is super common. I pull out my phone and I'm brushing my teeth. Like, let's see, it's two minutes. What else is going? Like, but I found myself getting in that habit for a while. Does anyone have any other examples of like 
seat is dragging at this time when I'm trying to procrastinate. Okay, when you're trying to procrastinate and you want to like feel productive by watching like a motivational TikTok video, like <laughs> feel productive. Yeah. Even though you're like in an activity, but like okay. Okay, okay, so Kofi, like a, a child that's upset, yeah, maybe. Uh, yeah. Like, we get stressed at work and we disengage, or we get stressed with our parents and we disengage. You know, I mean, there can be a variety of times where people are like, oh, this is hard. Let me go do something where it's easy. Any other examples? Trying to do a conversation or something like that. Oh, gotta go. Oh, interesting. Like, purposely, I gotta walk away from this. My phone is vibrating. Someone's <laughs> calling me or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I appreciate you all sharing, and I'm just trying to share. Most of us are distracted either because not because we want to be or because we want to be, that we like seek the opportunity to get distracted looking at a screen. Okay, I wanna share a couple of stories about how I got to where I am right now. Um, one, in August of 2020, I ended up in urban care because um, it was the first time that I had ever had stress that was physically manifesting, manifesting in me as pain. Um, at the time, the there was real fear, legitimate fear that an off-campus party would become a super spreader event and impact our campus operations even more. So the amount of meetings that I was getting pulled into and um, some people I think had some unfair expectations on what I could control related to off-campus parties. But anyway, I ended up having this shooting some pain that I thought, I thought I had to have a physical blockage. I was like, something has to be wrong. And it wasn't until I was in urgent care and had an x-ray done on my stomach that I was like, oh wow, I'm just that stressed. I never had that before. So I had heard this wisdom, focus on what I can control, let go of the rest. I had heard this before, but I had never really put it into practice or intentional practice until that urgent care trip. Okay, flash forward three years, my mom turned 60 and my husband and I took our family on an Alaskan cruise to celebrate her big milestone birthday. I was out the 8th through the 20th of September last year and I came back on the 21st to, to almost a thousand emails. And I was just mad. I was so pissed off and just trying to disengage all my like, forget it. Like it's too, you know, I was just but anyways, I was just I was mad. And coincidentally, Erica Benti had done this uh president, she did one of the one of the presidential fellows, and she had done this uh study about communication at CSU, had done this big survey about the most effective types of communication for students and for staff, depending on the type of communication. Well, her findings were in my email. So I, I wanted to read it because I remember taking that survey. So I opened up her um, opened up her survey, and she mentioned Cal Newport, a book called A World Without Emails. And I was clearly motivated at that point. And so I read that book, and then it was so um, impactful. I ended up doing a huge deep dive into all of Cal Newport uh, writings. And so I came back to this focus on what I can control and let go of the rest. And it was after reading Cal Newport that I redefined what I can control. That, that has been also a big shift for me in trying to live out this uh, wisdom. So um, I did So I did a big deep dive into Cal Newport. Cal Newport has written seven books. I read five of them, only four of which I'm talking about today. I also read his very first book, How to Win at College, because I just wanted to know like, how he started as an author. Um, but we're not talking about that today. What we're really talking about are these uh, four. Um, I read A World Without Email first, although that's his most recent book. Then I backed up and read So Good They Can't Ignore You, which was his um, fourth book, technically, but for kind of in this line. Then he wrote Deep Work, and then he wrote Digital Minimalism. If anyone else in here is a Cal Newport fan, he does have another book coming out in February called Slow Productivity. And he is arguing in that book about the importance of doing fewer things, working at a natural pace, and obsessing over quality. So if anyone wants to read more, if, if anyone here already likes how important and wants to read more, that's the next book that's coming out. Okay, so, so really what my um, 
talk today is what did I take away from reading all of these Cal Newport books? I've also listened to Cal Newport a lot of his podcasts. I've read some of his blog. I read his New Yorker from time to time. So I've read a lot from him. But it's these books uh, specifically that I'm sharing what my big lessons were. Some assumptions that I need to state before we move forward. One, I'm obviously processing Cal Newport's work through my own identities. Um, uh, I some of which I'll, I'll point some of which I'll point out here. I'm a millennial by age. Uh, I do not have kids. Um, I am generally neuro neurotypical. I also will say there are some things in here, some suggestions that Cal Newport has, or people might be like, ooh, I think I'd get in trouble if I do that. But I think I generally am valued at my job and I'm not in fear of like getting fired. I recognize we're all at will employees, shit can go south at CSU, I get that. But like, it, like day to day, I'm not like scared of like losing my job. And I recognize there's some privilege in that for sure. Additionally, Cal Newport's identities matter, right? And so how he's processing, but here's what I do know to be true about Cal Newport. He's got a PhD in electrical engineering, computer science. He's tenured faculty, does a lot of different writing. Um, as I mentioned, like blogs, New Yorker, books, obviously. The uncle is also a New York Times journalist. So he has like family that's in writing. Uh, he's married to a woman, has three kids, also millennial. I'm also going to assume he's like a semi-famous author with a 10-year position. I'm also going to assume he's got a lot of job security in what he does. Okay, two more assumptions. One, whether you like it or not, you're willing to participate in a capitalistic market. Um, I'm not saying we need to agree with capitalism. I'm not saying I agree with capitalism. I'm saying but we, we are in it to survive. And you're going to hear this comes up pretty early on that there's just, there's some level of acceptance, I guess, that we're in a capitalistic market. The other assumption, Cal Newport spends a lot of time in his books arguing that multitasking is inefficient, that we're all distracted most or all of the time, and that email is rarely or never meaningful work. I'm not going to dive into all that, but I'm I'm just that's just an assumption. If you want to read more about it, every single book of his talks about it, but I'm just I'm moving past that part. Okay, here we go into lessons and practices. Let me um one piece of feedback that I got in my last workshop, which is really helpful. Um, everything up here is Cal Newport's ideas. You're gonna hear some of my opinions come out naturally about some of the ideas. Uh there are also gonna be other significant ideas that I'm not mentioning in here. But what, what I'm really trying to say here is I might, I might say something that I'm like, oh, how many courts argue this? And you're going to get that bullshit. That does not work. You know, like, take what you like and leave what you don't like. This is a, an author um, that has done a lot of research, but like some of these just may not make sense for you. So I'm just trying to give a lot of offerings so that hopefully some of these are helpful to you. Okay. I initially thought when I built this workshop that I was going to do it based on each book, but what I ended up doing was rewriting it based on three major themes that run throughout all of the books. One is a craftsman mindset, then rest, then digital minimalism. So that's the order that we're going in. All right. So Cal Newport starts with, we should not believe the advice that you should follow your passion that that is not helpful advice to give to people. He argues that it is rare that we can identify our passion. It's rare that we even identify what we're passionate about, and it's even harder to identify a passion about that we can get paid for. He also argues that most people become passionate about something after they've invested time in it. Um, I've been on campus slide for 10 years. I used to work in slides with Pamela Norris, and Pamela was uh, kind enough to tell me about a position that was opening up an off-campus slide, and off-campus slide put a chance on me. But if you would ask me 10 years ago, like, oh, are you going to work for off-campus slide or help students that are commuting to campus or with their housing or ram ride? Like, no, I did not think that's like where I was going. But here I am 10, 10 years later, and I feel so thankful to have this job, and I do feel passionate about what I do. But I've invested time and expertise into what I do. I developed a passion for it. He also argues that following your passion leads people to believe that there is right work for them, that they just have to find the right work. But Cal Newport argues it's not about finding the right work. It's about how to work right in a way that is meaningful for you, where you feel you are contributing and you're doing meaningful work. And so, and we'll get more into that. 
So he argues that we should have a craftsman mindset as opposed to a passion mindset. He argues that a passion mindset is learning what the world can offer you as opposed to what you can offer the world. He talks a lot in great depth about the satisfaction that we have if we become a craftsman in whatever it is that you're producing. And I also want to honor, I know I'm using the word craftsman. I know that's gender language. I am using the language that he uses, but I want to, I, I recognize that. He talks about that in order to be a craftsman, you don't have to have a rarefied job. You just, you want to find your rarefied approach to your work. So you can be a craftsman in anything, but you are developing what deep, meaningful work looks like for you and whatever it is that you're doing. You're developing the rare approach. So the idea of a craftsman can certainly be someone who produces something tangible. My husband's a woodworker and he can focus on one project to produce some final product that's super visible, like he's an island for someone. My brother is a chef and he also can produce like really interesting and tasty meals for big special events. But now before, he actually has most of his writing for knowledge workers, people that don't work with their hands very often or don't produce physical objects very often. He says a craftsman could be becoming very skilled in running effective teams. Quality meeting minutes. Uh, being able to put together a motor reading communication that results in people taking action. Maybe you're a craftsman in grant writing, you're a craftsman in producing efficient research. Um, yeah, so it could, it could be anything. I feel weird saying this out loud, but something I feel like I've developed a skill in is if you want someone to win an award, let me help you write it. I feel like I've gotten really good at writing award nominations. <laughs> or I write really meaningful notes to parents. That's something I do for all my graduating students. I write a note to their parent. And so I've like, I think I've built a skill around like meaningful writing to help people understand the impact that someone else has had. So it can be it can be a variety of things uh, developing this craftsman. He talks about having our work, and in order to feel motivated by our work and therefore wanting to become a craftsman in our work, we need to have autonomy or control over how we do our work. We need to have competence, the feeling that we're good at what we're doing, and relatedness, the feeling of connection to others. He, he goes into great depth about that, but it, he's really uh, encouraging people to, if you are dissatisfied in your work, is it because you're dissatisfied with how much control you do or do not have? Is it because you haven't built up the competence yet, or do you not feel connected to the people around you and to analyze those two things? Okay, last two points on this. He also talks about if you get good at something, you'll eventually hit a plateau. And so you need to introduce deliberate practice into something that's valuable to build up your career capital. He gives an example where he plays the guitar and he interviewed a guitarist, and he was learning that he played the guitar for about the same amount of time growing up every week that this other big kind of guitarist did, but this guitarist he's interviewing is not getting paid to play guitar, how the court is not. And he realized that one of the biggest differences was that guitarist who's getting paid to do what he does would institute deliberate practice where he would push himself to learn more challenging notes. Or, I'm not a music artist, I don't know why I'm going to say this, like more challenging, like order of notes. Chords, thank you, play chords. <laughs> Well, Cal Newport was saying, yeah, like I would learn one song and then I would just play that song over and over and over again because it felt good because I knew how to do it. So he talks about like push yourself. Once you get good at something, you'll eventually hit a plateau if you want to push yourself beyond that. Okay, last thing. He also talks about taking little bets to test out your skills. Test out if you're passionate about something and if you want to put more time. So like my husband, he, he made little bets on himself by building items for friends and things like that before launching a small business where he builds for clients. My brother's doing this by testing out different types of special events to see where he eventually wants to like put his whole effort into like, he like caters for like sports teams and stuff to see if that's like his specialty. Uh, this presentation for me right now is actually a little bet. Uh, I intend to have my career at CSU and I've had wonderments about just like where my career will take me. And I'm like, oh, could like training development be in my future? So I, after I read all these, I purposely challenged myself by building out a workshop that I hope was applicable and helpful for others to see one if I enjoyed it, and then two if other people enjoyed me and found it helpful. But like this is a, this is a little bit for me. Okay, 
So we were talking about marathon running earlier. So, you know, when you're marathon running, you're developing a specific skill, long disease running. You're engaging in deliberate practice where you're pushing yourself to get further and further. And it's a little bit harder each time, but you're focused in on a deliberate practice, autonomy, you know, you control where you're running. Um, and I know people talk about runner's high. I just don't know if <laughs> that to me is like the following, like don't follow your passion. Like get a little bit of this and then you will really start to enjoy it as we get it. Okay, and pause. I know it's say pause and turn to the group. How is this? How is this landing on you? Do you see any of this being true in your own life? And if people are willing to share, or is there any of this where you're like, Lindsay, that's weird? <laughs> yeah. Um, about the passion and developing what they're good at. So I went for the state floor seminar for the education college. My background is not in natural resources, it's an animal science. So when I started my position, I was like, man, I'm kind of like, I don't know everything about trees. But then I realized, and I'm sharing this with my intern. It's not it's developing those skills and being able to come to that resource they need and resources. And that's just you know, I love my job. I mean, mm -hmm. really Interesting. So you don't see yourselves being like a craftsman and like understanding everything about forestry, but you contribute to your job in really meaningful ways that optimizes like the performance of your team because you're running effective meetings, things like that. Mm -hmm. That's great. How long have you been in your role now? Four years. Okay. Did you find yourself developing passion over time for what you were doing? Yeah, I'm so pretty figured out I knew what I was doing. Okay. <laughs> I mean, like you had some competence, right? Like you, like you, yeah, that makes sense. That's, yeah. Um, the deliberate practice one for me resonates a lot. Um, more in a personal sense um, that I've developed into using in my career and schooling and stuff throughout, but. Um, I learned the practice, like the, the practice of deliberate practice um, through sports um, growing up, and then um, noticing the ones, the people around me who were you know, excelling and going way beyond like the way I thought I could ever achieve were the ones who would hit their limit and then push past it, find some way to develop a skill that was um, more than just the one that you can do like right now, like look ahead. See, like, oh, well, I think this would be helpful. I can't do that right now. And then institute ways, like, whether it's outside of normal time to take that extra, extra work and go into it. Um, and then, you know, personally, I, when I came to CSU, I decided to try out a new sport in uh, volleyball. And it was, I mean, it was stressful. I felt like a lot of my skills translated pretty well. Um, but it was a brand new sport and a brand new um, challenge for me. And it took a lot of those practice to, to take what I did know and turn that into skills that really helped. So, um, and then I try to help, you know, use the same sort of practice in my schooling, whether it's my art classes that I was taking here to get better at um, graphic design, drawing skills, and stuff like that. Um, and then more in, in like the professional world since I've gradu graduated and seeing what my coworkers can do and, and seeing. Of their um, specific skills might seem like they just like already knew how to do it, um, but then I realized that it's actually just through like being intentional about the way that they that they practice the way that they transition things like that. So I remember, so this is Leif, who works for LSE Marketing, but used to be a student graphic designer in my office. And I remember I was traveling for a conference and I was presenting something about safe ride, something related to brand ride. And I, you were helping me build out a PowerPoint and you had just bought like a new pen or a new pad or something. And I distinctively remember you saying, oh, Lindsay, I'll help you with your PowerPoint. I'm really interested in learning this new technique. Can I try it on your PowerPoint? And you very purposely forced yourself to learn how to do it by testing it out on my PowerPoint. So I, I see you doing that deliberate practice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I remember this question I brought Actually, a graduate student here with me with slice um, a year ago. And the first line kind of gave me trouble a little bit um, because I feel like the work that I did in undergrad and a lot of mentors I had, people talking about career advice, career advice said to follow your passions and to find 
being told or and I felt a lot of panic, not necessarily for me, but for a lot of the students that I worked with and my friends that the first job straight out of college was not sure that they were going to So I feel like there is a first generation of that that expects to feel connected and feel yeah. Well, the one of the conversations that I've had with students like a year after they graduate or two years after they graduate, something just maybe more what they expected. I'm not a believer that like your job to be your life or that you know you should love your job, but this idea of being a craftsman where I can find fulfilled in producing some type of in becoming a craftsman of whatever it is. I do see the value in that. If I'm, I'm here 40, 45 hours a week, I do want to have some level of fulfillment of my job. That's a big part of my life. And so yeah, that's but it I mean, it certainly did not come right when I came off campus. Like the all ramrite was a mess. It was it was so hard and I felt lost every day and I didn't know what I was doing and you know it was helpful that I felt connected to humans and had great people supporting me. And so but the passion Hopefully comes later. Now, I don't really, I don't really tell it all back here. He does say that there are times that you should leave your job, that you should not try to become a craftsman. Um, if you believe that your job is harming the world, if you feel no relation to the people around you and they are not there to support you, and there's one other one. So he gives some caveats that sometimes it's like, yeah, you do need to go. And yeah. Okay, that's craftsman. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I I just I'm glad you had that story because what I kept thinking with that first one is don't follow your passion. And I feel like for me, like I was almost like that hmm. because I think there's so much focus on your work defining what you do hmm. and being good at your work and being good at hmm. And I feel like there's so much, you know, raising my kids. It's all about what do you love to do? Mm -hmm. Because eventually you have to make money to support yourself, but you better have passion mm -hmm. or why are you working? Mm -hmm. And so I was thinking about that and kind of like passion is for me, passion is kind of why you like I work to live. Mm -hmm. So and and I, I think at some point I wish that I would have had a mentor. When I was getting into the workforce, go, you can be a professional skateboarder and you might be way more successful than building a car. You know, and maybe following that path instead of taking the safe route or harder than that. Okay, okay. Okay, so. Yeah, I'm going to say, Believing that you have to follow your passion for your career could be dangerous. It could work out, but and also don't like let go of your passion. Like if you love to skateboard, I hope you're still skateboarding. Like versus just like fully ignore it. There's no way you could make money doing that. Yeah, I think. Following your passion. Okay, that's valid. That makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that. Okay, we are going to talk about the third one, rest. Um, he doesn't, this is probably the one that has the least amount of um, time spent on it in the book. In the books. Um, Cal Newport argues, you know, we're not like an endless supply of energy. We do need to rest. And he gives some suggestions or advice in how to make your rest Restful, re energizing, recharging. I generally enjoy being productive. And for a long time, admittedly, I judged my self worth on my productivity. A lot of people would tell me, rest more, rest more. But I interpreted resting as just like zoning out, no responsibilities, which for me meant I'm watching Netflix. I can sit down for one night and watch. I would say two or three hours of Netflix, and I feel okay. But once it's the second night, I start to feel pretty antsy. So I was really struggling with like 
okay, I get that my productivity isn't how I should define my self worth, but I also don't like just like zoning out. I, I was misunderstanding or I had a hard time defining what rest meant to me. I, I started to feel unfulfilled. Then I read this quote from deep work. One of the things I meant to do was put this quote up on the screen so people could read along. I did not do that. Here we go. So this um, Cal Newport is um, referencing some other research. From, um, and it says, ironically, jobs are actually easier to enjoy than free time. Because like flow activities, they have built-in goals, feedback rules, and challenges, all of which encourage us to become involved in our work, to concentrate, and release one's self energy. Free time, on the other hand, is unstructured and requires greater effort to be shaped into something that can be enjoyed. Free time, on the other hand, is unstructured and requires much greater effort to be shaped into something that can be enjoyed. So, so Cal Newport takes that and says, human beings, it seems, are at their best when immersed deeply in something challenging. So I'm not a believer that I'm going to do off-campus life work all the time. I need a break from my work. Kind of day. So when I read that about like unstructured rest can be unfulfilling, that like really hit me. Where I was like, oh yeah, I do feel unfulfilled if I just have two many nights in a row watching Netflix. So he, he recommends that your rest should be intentional and it should be structured. And he links this back to craftsman mindset. So what I've done for me is I have... I try to take in the crafty mindset in my rest where I'm not necessarily producing something of value. Because I also think in our culture, we have like a big life side hustle. Like you're doing a hobby, it's because you're making money with it. But I have I have started to put myself into projects where I'm learning something new, but I'm not doing it on anyone's timeline and I'm not doing it to anyone's um, quality level. It's just something that I can learn that's new. Um, it's also helpful for me that I use my hands and I'm away from screen. So um, I learned how to, um, I've always wanted to know how to knit or the other one, crochet. I've tried, I don't know how many times in my life. Then I get overwhelmed. And then I've learned about loop yarn. I'm like, half the work's done for you. So you can knit with your fingers. Oh my God, y'all. So I, now I'm like knitting and I knitted, um, I ended up knitting a blanket. I had no intention of what I was going to do with it, but I ended up being there for ways to start a crochet challenge. And now I'm doing like a scarf and kind of see like what that like. But it's, it's rest, but I'm away from screens. It's intentional. I'm working on something. I have no timeline for myself. I have no intention of what I'm going to do with that end product. And so that's just an example of Kelvin Port talked about just making your rest intentional and structured. Okay, he also talks about high quality leisure. He argues our brain doesn't need as much rest as it needs change. He says that if you spend time in, he says it's good for you to spend time in demanding activities and not necessarily to always have a passive consumption. Um, yeah, this is where he, he, he specifically argued that doing something physical can be helpful for you. Um, even if it's demanding, even if you're learning something new, he just talks about the change in activity is helpful for us. He also talks about high quality leisure as building in social experiences. Okay, so just to be clear. What I was just talking about would be like a great introvert experience, and I find being an introvert is really helpful for me to kind of be on my own. But then, if you're extroverted, you find being with people really re-energizing. He talks about building in social experiences like board game nights. He specifically said that board games are with other humans, but there's competition and rules built in, so there's structure built into them. He also talks about them being a supercharged socialization where you can be more intense than you normally would be in our pleasant society. <laughs> he doesn't, I really want to read more about this admittedly. He does not give us more information about what intense or supercharged socialization is. But I want to read more about it because I know that I have nights where I'm playing board games or I'm bowling or I'm kickballing with staff or whatever. And I love getting intense. And then I go home, you know, I'm kind of done for the night. And I'm like, what is it about that like intense experience that's fun and that you can be yeah, like it's the pleasant society. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Um, <laughs> he describes it like being, oh, I'm sorry, it's not pleasant. I'm sorry, it's polite. I'm sorry. He describes it as being polite. That in a supercharged experience, you don't have to be polite. 
And so I'm like, what is it about it where I like enjoy like kind of like yelling at you and it's okay and I don't be more about that, but he also talks about how the same can happen in social fitness experiences, and that's one of the reasons that those are so popular. But he talks about regularly, and so he, he gives some examples of like, you know, there's like gyms and you kind of build up like a cohort of people that you go to a specific gym with. And he says, particularly if you regularly play the same board game or participate in the same fitness group, it also allows you to develop any new language or gives you a sense of feeling of belonging within the group. So he encourages people to seek real-world structured social interactions. Stephen's recommendations like consider seasonal or weekly. So in my own life, I play kickball every summer with a group of staff here at CSU. And then twice a week, I also work out with a group of staff at the gym, and so, just as examples. But those are real-world structured social interactions. Okay, last two. He talks about the importance of solitude. He says that we need time for unhurried self reflection, free from the input of others. This is free from conversations, free from thoughts of others, like a podcast or a TV show or something, or even a book. It doesn't mean you have to be physically alone. You could be sitting in a coffee shop, you could be walking through campus. But he talks about intentionally putting yourself in a situation where you're not inviting in thoughts or content from others. So he says, like, if you're going to go walk your campus, consider leaving your phone in the office. He talks about journaling or writing letters to yourself. Just talks about solitude. Just have times where you're not talking to anyone and you don't have a podcast in or something. Because you're not taking in thoughts from others. And it's important for us to have unhurried self-reflection. He also briefly talks about the need for idle time. He talks about how being idle is not being lazy. It's a recharge and it's necessary. I, this, I interpret it as like, this is okay for me to sit down and watch Netflix for an hour. Like, I just need the time where I am zoning out. I'm just letting some funny thing come at me and I'm, I'm good. And so, um, but he talks about finding the right balance for you. So how much idle time you have of like passive consumption. I learned for me like 30 to 60 minutes a night and then I'm using The last thing, this is a really small note, but I took away uh, related to this. He talks about how um, some of us work really long work days. Uh, and when we come home from work, we really we have time to like eat dinner, shower, go to bed, or whatever it is. But for folks that are working in like an eight-hour day, roughly, he talks about how there's quite a bit of time outside of that day to do other things. I do believe this can be really different based on if you're like a caretaker or something or how big your community is. So I think it can really be different per person on this one for sure. But one of the things he recommends that my husband and I do every morning, when we come home from work, we don't say to each other, how was your day? Because then we feel like we're knowing him as our day. We just I'll say, how was work? Or how was the work portion of your day? Because then I'm acknowledging we're like shifting into the evening and we can do things in the so it's just a small language thing that I've taken away that I do have time to rest in the evening and 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 I do not have a big commute on me. I uh, I'm a caretaker my parents in some ways, but they're not living with me yet, so I'm not really caretaking for them. So I recognize that this is some of my language, but I just liked that language. Okay, so then the marathon thing, I think about this too. Like when you're training something, you also still actively rest when you're training for the marathon. You're not an endless amount of energy that can go run. You still have to rest. For most people that are training for some type of long run, it's usually intentional. You have like one active rest day. You're going to go walk for a mile or I've never run a marathon, I don't know. But like you have something like that. It's structured and intentional so you can recharge for your next run. Okay, I'm pausing. How is this? I find this one to be some of the most controversial points of his book. I'm curious how this is landing for people. For me, it's... So I, I also, I'm outside of the bookstore, I work, my name is Jake, I'm a student of so it's like a lot of my research. And a lot of my days are extremely intentional, extremely structured. I'm writing five minutes for at at one time. I'm reading literature, I'm looking something up, I'm conferring with my PI that's next to me. So my rest time is not that at all. Mm -hmm. you know, my younger, my partner takes it, he's like, what are we doing? And then I'm like, nothing. Mm -hmm. He's like, where are we going to go? And I'm like, nope, I'm going to sit here, and then I might play my video game, I'm going to watch TV, I'm going to sit down. So I mean, entirely opposite of what I do. 
And I and also there are days where I'm in the lab by myself with my cameras, so I have that solitude. Well, actually, there are times on my rest where I need to go and out with people or go to the bar. So I think really your rest is depending on what your anonymous days are and where do you get that type of structure and how you have it. I hadn't thought about like what if you already have a lot of solitude time built in when you're not interesting. Okay, I appreciate that. Some people they have a long day. And I mean, you and I are kind of in that same spot with parents. Mm -hmm. You've got some elder parents all mm -hmm. or grandkids or whatever. And your day at work may be eight, nine, ten hours, but your day is really 16, 17, 18 hours, mm -hmm. and you need to mindfully force yourself into the rest. Mm -hmm. And that can be hard because we're a lot of life, we've got to be going, we've got to be productive. Mm -hmm. So, my high quality leisure is eating, brushing, mm -hmm. cross stitching. Mm -hmm. I don't do the, the screen because I feel like I got to pay attention to it. Oh. Whereas if I'm doing a simple pattern or something, I can just kind of zone out mm. and let my mind go where it needs to go. I love that. But some people have to force themselves into it because of the way the life is structured or the way it has to be. Sure. That makes sense. I've learned um, I I have a rule for myself. If I want to have intentional rest, I mean my rest time in a way that serves me well, I can't look at TikTok. To, oh man, I used to think oh, it's like two to three minutes. No, I lose 15 minutes so fast on there at least. So I like have rules with myself because I, I won't spend my time in a way that actually feels recharging. Yeah, intention, yeah, structuring it and being intentional and, and making my eyes. So here you like, I've hit points where I'm like, I have to be done working tonight, whether it's OCL work, helping my mom with something, whatever it is, I have to be done tonight. I have to have downtime right now. Or I can't just work myself to bed. Well, as humans, we physically cannot not sustain. Yeah. <laughs> Any other thoughts? Yeah. I tell you a little bit more about how I incorporate rest into my work week. I don't often have a lot of time with people at home. Um, so I'm thinking about, I see a lot of different people that go to work and rest and do things during downtime or during the lunchtime. And so, my goal is to try to figure out how I can incorporate some of this while that hmm. well, you talk about that more in this morning. Yeah. <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I'm like solitude, like you can talk about walking on campus, and, you know, but I feel like I can breeze past that. Like, what does it look like to take a break? Yeah, I'm talking about work is like the hour chunk all at once, but we need breaks in there too. Yeah, okay, I like that. I like that. I'll, well, I'll leave it there. For me, um, I know probably be here um, slice. Um, for me, I think I, I, well, I, I appreciate how it works. Work, um, so, um, I, I think the rest piece, I, I kind of go back and forth with it. I think I have incorporated some of the intentional structure pieces. So I wanted to make sure that it's healthy and high time as well. How I've incorporated um, day to day practice. Um, I'm going to go to the hospital. i to the hospital. to the hospital. i I'm going to go to the i to i to i to i to um, just getting on my for the work day. Night. Walk home. That is that intentional structure. So you mean that we just decompress from physical separation from work home, but also that mental separation from working. I can we all laugh like most of us don't immediately change it at home clothes we get home yeah 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 and the other other way that i try to 
some semester is um, is uh, taking taking extended time off. Mm -hmm. Right, and so having that intentional structure, you know, for example, some people want to like backpack and like solo travel. Um, and so having a privilege, having a, a time and flexibility and support to do that, and be with myself in a completely different environment, right? Have like a different frame of mind, a different experience, a different way to engage and teach what we do for this purpose. Um, reception and accountability is mm -hmm. huge. I come back and so take some of that and run with it for a couple of months. Left. That will be there. That will be fun. Thanks for sharing. Yeah. You've got me thinking back to Dan's comment about how do we have extended time off, but how are we doing it during the day? So I'm just thinking about, yeah, both matter. Oh, I feel like having two little places to be one and five more. Oftentimes, the day after the work day does seem to be um, more exhausting. It's like um, absolutely incredible, but also it does save you know, a lot of challenges. Um, one thing I've tried to do, which I'll be doing, is like, um, I <laughs> um, but I, I Sometimes more focused. It's something I've really seen. And I love that you do that with an hourglass. I like that you're not reliant on looking at a screen to tell you when you're done because you can see other things when you look at the screen. I love that you do that in like an analog way. That's cool. It feels like it promotes breathing more. And you know, find myself to take a shower, but it's here and you know, definitely be able to look at something at all. Maybe it's just, I like it. Hmm. Thanks for sharing, y'all. Okay, our last section is about digital minimalism, and this is where we're going to get into like a world without emails and um, some uh online or digital processes uh, that he recommends. Okay, I feel like he spends so much time talking about this in the book, I can't not mention it, but admittedly I've never attempted this. I've never been like super interested in attempting it, but I get why people recommend, I get why he recommends it. He's, he talks, what he recommends is a 30 day declutter to get started. And he, uh, three things in order to do this declutter. One, is you need to set up rules for any technology in your life that is optional. And he describes optional as like, you wouldn't lose your job and you could like still stay in communication with your family if there was like an emergency. So he first says you need to identify what type of technology you're trying to declutter from. This could be a phone, Google, internet in general, your computer, text messages, social media, video games, TV, maybe your Gmail, maybe something like that. Um, he challenges you to think about, know the difference between what's convenient and what's critical. And then once you've identified all the technology that you use in your life, you define how and when you will be allowed to use technology, if at all. So you could, you know, I, I know there's some people do like 30 day, uh, no social media, that happens, right? But if social media is part of your job, that would be good. So maybe it's like, I'm allowed to go on, you know, if you run LSC marketing, I'm allowed to go on the LSC Instagram to do that, but I don't go on my own Instagram, for example. Um, so he says, define what that looks like for you. Then when you step away from the technology, you got to have a plan in place of what to fill your time with. And this is where he talks about intentional rest and craftsmen. So what are you doing during the times that you're not using the technology you would have normally been using? So that you want to identify ahead of time. So you know what you're doing. 
And then he argues to reintroduce the technologies one at a time and with a purpose. He asks you to identify what need is it fulfilling? Does it still fulfill that need? Or could you just be done with it forever? So he argues like, maybe you're on Instagram and you're like, I really like Instagram because um, I, have a, I have a nephew back in California and I really like to see pictures of my nephew. And that's the only way I see it because that's where his mom and dad post the pictures on Instagram. So does it make sense then for me to just like unfollow everything else on Instagram and that's all I do on Instagram if I just see it for my nephew. But, uh, but then I don't let myself get sucked into like scrolling through stuff as an example. Okay. Digital minimalism part two. He talks about practicing time away from the phone. This one really hit me. That we're so addicted to our phones that we check it even when we don't hear a ding and we're nervous that we miss something. He recommends that you set length, lengths of time that you will not look at your phone for any reason. And then increase that, increase that, increase that. And this is training you to look away from screen and be able to truly focus in on whatever the work is that you're doing. He said, don't look at your phone for any reason, not even something that's productive. Just put your phone away, you know, say 30 minutes, 60 minutes. If it helps you like have a pen and paper near you. So like, if you do think of something like, oh, I need to do that. You can like write your thought down somewhere. I've been doing this for some time now. Um, I, I don't do it in specific lengths of time. I do it during certain activities. Um, so my husband, my husband's a woodworker, works in construction, and I spend a lot of time at like Home Depot and Lowe's and lumber yards and it's a big part of my life. And um, I help my husband with a lot of projects, but I'm just like labor. Like I like lift a lot of shit and move it over here. And then just, I do I it a lot. And so when I'm at Home Depot or Lowe's or lumber yards or whatever, I'm not doing anything else. I'm just following him. And y'all, for years, I would just look at my phone. I'd be like, oh, this is the time that I do this because he's out there shopping or whatever. I now have a rule for myself that whenever I'm in the store, I'm just, I'm just in a moment with him and I'm practicing myself to become less and less addicted to my phone. Cal Newport recommends you try 10 minutes and 20 minutes, 30 minutes, and work your way up for a couple of hours. And I have to admit, y'all, it was way harder than I thought it was going to be. To just walk in the home depot for 10 minutes and not look at my phone at all. You know, and, and I would try to convince myself, like, oh, we need to check what the weather is going to be like. We're outside for that project, you know, like productive stuff. But he just, that's, that has been one of my most uh, impactful practices that I can put my phone away now for a pretty extended period of time. I don't feel like I have to check it in case I miss something. <laughs> He talked a lot about social media, how social media just takes a lot of time for us. He really talks about memoirs and social media. So I mentioned on the last slide, he talks about um, why are you on the social media and is it the best way to meet that need? So like I mentioned earlier, my nephew, like does it make sense for me to have Instagram so I can see my nephew's pictures? Or do I just make myself have a monthly FaceTime chat with my sister and brother-in-law so I can see my nephew and see them every month? He argues in the book that we as a society, if we, in general, if we find any benefit to having an app, we will have it. But he argues it should have enough benefit to outweigh the cons. So even if an app has a benefit, it's not enough. It needs to have significant value for your life. He also talks about prioritizing face-to-face -face or at least verbal communication. He talks how people have like conversation over text messages and he argues that we should only use text messages to arrange the logistics of the next time we will see that person, like time and locations, but to not have a full conversation over text. Related to this, he also says that if there are people who mean a lot to you in your life, but you don't regularly see them, like maybe siblings or family, childhood friends, something, don't interact with them on social media. He said that when we like something on social media, it gives us a false sense of connection. But what we actually need to do is call them or go see them. Less frequent in-person or phone conversations will always be more meaningful than frequent likes on social media. 
hear you we need to hear our voices see our body language and engage like with that before conversation before we recharge in our connections with other humans that's another one i've implemented in my life where i don't like stuff on my all my close friends social media i don't i if i do really like something that's happening in their life i call them now Okay, I'm about ready to move into emails specifically. Any thoughts about the about these um, suggestions? Um, there is a function. I know I'm coming. Okay. What you're saying is actually look up the number of times you want to come during your phone number, and it's a bit silly. Oh, as if you are messaging someone, you know, every five minutes. He does talk about studies in his digital minimalism book where uh, people had to estimate how many times they picked up a phone a day and then they actually were able to reveal how in it, on average people were looking at their phones three times more than they thought they actually were. One thing is so funny, it can be very useful. I mean, my son was deployed to Guam and Hawaii and everywhere. It was really nice to have that app, especially when I was in Guam, because at that time it wasn't, you know, the phones that would mm. match up. Um, it gets addicting. Mm. And you just keep on. Mm. Keep on. And I had to learn to say, no, that's it. Call me. You're yeah. on your state site now. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> So it sounds like when he was deployed initially, it provided great value. Oh, Otherwise, it would have cost us you know, 100 bucks every phone call. But then once it did not provide as much value or as needed, but you were just in it, then, yeah. What I'm interesting about that I heard is that Netflix and social media and stuff are designed to help. Oh, yeah. So your brain physically never going to do that connection. Um, so that's like, <laughs> and it's just muscle memory in your brain. Like it's, it's just crazy to think about that, like they designed it. <laughs> no, <laughs> then that's not the excuse. It's like they said, like, wait next week for the next episode, or um, um, you know, wait till your friend gets you back, or whatever. It's literally designed to. Mm -hmm. So that's what we're just like, get back to social media. Where are we going to talk? It is an addiction, and it, it is perfect that the blue light will keep you sleeping and people won't sleep, so they make you more screen time, and it's just bills. One thing I hear my husband say a lot is, um, it's fixed up, but my dad will work right now and spending a lot of time on like Craigslist and eBay looking for stuff. So we'll like put on whatever show we're watching, and then he's just on his phone searching for stuff, and he'll look up and be like, Wow, this episode's really long. And I'm like, <laughs> Like, oh, this is the next episode. We need to catch on. You're saying there's like no stopping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. talked about how I guess there's like research connected to like slot machines, very similar to social media that when you refresh it, it's like it, you know new information that's coming up or surprise or like a reward that's coming up. And one thing that I did for a while, I felt myself about three or four, no, four years ago, 2019, I felt myself getting more addicted to my phone. And I read about this thing um, that the blue light and the color that comes at it. So uh, it can be kicks in a lot of your endorphins or something. So I turned on my black and white mode on my phone. And now that was just like a temporary fix. That's like, you know, that was me trying to like not actually spend less time on my phone, but you know, whatever. Uh, I don't think I could have identified that looking at social media made me feel good until it was in black and white. Then I felt the lack of endorphins. I'd look at my phone and be like, oh, it's boring. I would put it down. And mm -hmm. so that was a a temporary attempt for me to be less addicted to my phone. I wow. Uh, the um now I think very differently and like I just need to truly put my phone away. But yeah. Okay. Yes. Just a, a quick um note here. Um, I'm about the social media stuff. I'm in kind of like a limbo phase right now where I deleted my Instagram like Closing it on two years ago, 
Um, but being in graphic design and now um, working for the LSC marketing department, um, it's, you know, come back into my life and it's something that I need to, you know, not only use occasionally as like as far as like checking the, the posts or um, looking at statistics and analytics and stuff about it since that's something that we use. Um, it's, I'm also in a place where I'm like, how do I, I would mean, like reintroduce it um, back into, into my life um, on a personal sense as well. Um, there's, I mean, multiple reasons why I stopped using it to begin with. Um, but, you know, it's still something that's a big part of marketing and, and design and staying on public terms and things is an important part of my job. Um, so it's, it's like this weird balance, not exactly sure how I'm going to start reintroducing it. Um, right now, I just don't have the app, and if I need to use it, I use it on the desktop or the mobile version, which is this awful UI. <laughs> so that's right there. Just like, put it down on the pitch. <laughs> um, but it's, I don't know, it's kind of at this weird place right now. I'm still trying to figure out what, what balance is. Interesting. Yeah, interesting. And the other factor is we're such an instant society. We're expected to mm -hmm. reply. We're mm -hmm. expected if there's not a reply within an hour, people think we're dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? And to train people to say, if I get back to you within 24 hours, that's good. That's hard. People don't want that. Mm -hmm. Or, yes. Um, what if the technology is critical about how we do things? So they're saying the technology is important. So, what if, yeah, that's, yeah. It's part of your rest, it's part of your lease, and you're just part of your practice. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I appreciate that question. I'm taking it like a challenge in a good way. I appreciate that. It makes a lot of sense. My mom and so very specific social media channel on Instagram that was just dedicated to me. Mm. And like it was only me posting on that, but also many people were in that same space. And so that was really therapeutic. Mm. And it was like how I worked through that journey. So sometimes I think like there's good and bad to every social media piece, you know, and then now that she's gone, I really don't. Spend as much time, like I don't really spend time on that particular channel, like Instagram feed, but it was really helpful as I was moving through that journey. So I think there's ways of pinpointing that to you, but I think I'm going to come back to your comment in just a second in the next slide. I think Cal Newport doesn't operate on social media. I think he's got some pretty strong polarizing feelings on social media because he. He's fully off of it. And but I do hear your argument that it can provide value when you're what you're going through to find like a group of people who that online platform that was therapeutic for you through a hard time. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So they have kind of like open and closure to it too, right? Yeah, it's still out there, but it's like it doesn't serve that need that I yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I also hear you like you're producing music and doing something like an app. That that brings me back to like crafting mindset. You're becoming an expert in this thing that is on technology. It's not building something with your hands in the same way. But that I think would align with crafting. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Hmm. Let me think that. So you know, earlier I talked about how um, I, in general, think I value my job that I'm not nervous of like losing my job. Um, and so there are some email things that I have implemented and I've had to talk to some people about it, about some changes in how I function on email. I had to reset some expectations for people because I didn't want folks getting mad at me or feeling like I wasn't working, you know, like I was trying to do less or, I mean, I am trying to do less email, but like do less significant work for CSU students. Yeah, this, this one, I hit friction with a few people. Okay, so he has a whole book. So he wrote Digital Minimalism. Um, and one of the questions the last time I did this workshop was asked, like, what books do I recommend? If you are going to read, if you're interested in reading a world without email, I wouldn't back up to Digital Minimalism. 
he like lightly touches on some stuff, but I think this was um, much more concrete, maybe in some of his applications. Uh, and so he talks about how when email came in, that it didn't just make communication easier, it increased our communication expectation of each other. He talks about how emails and computers were introduced as being the machine for us. Computers were introduced as being the machine for us, but since email, we have become the machine or we're expected to become a machine. He gives a lot of time in talking about this hyperactive hive mind, meaning that communication via email that takes place one sentence or one paragraph at a time and spread out over long periods of time is not how our minds were built to communicate. That as humans, we were built to communicate in person, talk back and forth, set up a plan, and then move forward. But if I write one sentence to you, then I'm working with other people, then you write back you know, several hours later, and we weren't built to communicate in short snippets like that. So he talks about how email is really unhealthy for us in the way that we communicate. <laughs> so he gives some he gives some specific recommendations on how to do email better, and I'm going to talk about three of them that I believe. One, introducing friction. I'm sure that most people in here have had an experience where you have a quick question for someone, and you don't know if it's going to produce anything valuable or not. You're not totally sure what the answer is going to be. But you maybe thought or heard people say, well, what's the harm in asking? What's the harm in emailing? For you sending the email, 30 seconds. But you might be putting an hour of work or something or more on someone else. So you are harm, you could potentially be harming, harming, putting work on someone for something that isn't work very much. But it's really easy from your end to do it. So he says, introduce your own friction. So now when I'm going to write an email to someone or when I'm thinking about emailing someone, I consider is the email, whatever I'm going to ask, is it so important that I would get up right now and go walk to their office or I would pick up the phone and have a phone conversation with them? Is it important enough to put friction into my life? It is. Sometimes I'm like, yeah, I need this answer from you. I can't move forward without this. I mean, yeah, but but there are times where I'm like, oh, I'm curious. And I'm just like, that's not a way for the next time I see them around the building. Or just the next time I see them. It, he, in general, he argues, send less email. Put, introduce your own friction. And that should be your litmus test for whether you're going to send an email or not. Would you spend your old time walking to them or calling them to ask that question? If it's not important enough to interrupt your day, it's not important enough to interrupt their day. Well, he did not say that. I just said that. I'm going to keep saying that. That was so good. It's not going to have to interrupt your day. It's not going to have to interrupt their day. <laughs> okay. Internal communication. So his recommendation, if I have an email that only my immediate off-campus life colleagues are going to see, I don't send it. I just wait to talk about it during the staff meeting. Unless there is no other way. Like right now, I'm trying to figure out like every time we get five minutes from vice president of student affairs meeting, I send that out to the team so they can all read the meeting minutes. I don't know if we can do that yet. I house it somewhere. I don't know. I'm okay with that. So there are some emails that I do send because I don't know how else better to do it because it's a whole you know communication thing or whatever. But if I just have like a question for my team or an update for my team that's only a few sentences, it just waits until the next staff meeting. So then um, and I do that even for one-on-ones. Um, if I have an email that is only going to be sent to one colleague, I don't send it. And so then what I have in my notebook is I have dedicated, next time I talk to Nancy, I need to talk to her about this. Next time I talk to Justin, I need to talk to her about this. And when I think about something for them, I write it in here. So every staff member or my boss I have in here, or group meetings, like my whole off-campus life meeting or my RAM, right? they all have their own pages. And items just wait until I see them next. I don't send an email to them. Um, I don't send an email to them. So no emails that are only for immediate or internal colleagues. Okay, last one. He talks about we've got to write better emails that help us get to the bottom of whatever we're doing faster. He said some of us, we're real good at writing emails that are really quick 
and we don't have a lot of detail in it, so we can hit send and get it off of our to-do list. But the shittier the email is going out, it's a poor response you get back, and then you're back and forth with each other. He specifically, <laughs> so he works in higher ed, and um, I don't, maybe this is common amongst our things, but he called out higher ed specifically. He hates the, he puts in quotation, thoughts, question mark. He's like, no, you ask specific questions so they can get specific answers. Or um, he he talks about if you need to schedule a meeting, don't just send the email. It's like, when are you available? You could look at their calendar and be like, hey, I see you're available Thursday at 11 a.m. Does that work? If not, Friday at noon, let me know which one and I'll send the meeting in my one thing that I've done now when I send emails is I will purposely tell people not to email me back based on certain things. So I'll like update them and be like, if this sounds good to you, do not write back to me. I just assume it's good. Don't write back. I don't want to invite back to it. Um, yeah, he just talked about put in write high quality emails because it invites in less communication back to you. So even though you're trying to send it out faster and get it off the to-do list faster, you're inviting more work later. Okay, um, kind of related to this, he also talks about how we should set up our own internal processes or protocols. So these are things that you can change about your own work. Um, you might have to manage expectations of others, but you don't need to change what they do. For example, um, I have to sign a lot of financial documents for off campus life. Nancy, my office manager, she sends me all those documents to send, uh, to sign. I don't want to change how she works in her process of sending me these documents. So I set it up in my email where the documents automatically get routed out of my inbox to a separate box. And I know twice a week I check that and sign it all at once and send it back to her. So I had to tell her, you're only going to get signatures from me twice a week. You can send it to me all you want. But I, and I won't even let it hit my inbox. I don't want to be distracted by it. But that's my own internal process that I set up to manage my work. I didn't get um, so some specific um, protocols that he says that a lot of knowledge workers need to think about. One, scheduling meetings. He talked about the process is pain, painful and time consuming. You need to determine how you will effectively schedule your meetings. Does it mean that you can use an app or like a you know, Calendly or whatever so the external partner of the day can see it? Um, will you make it a practice to always look at your colleagues calendar ahead of time and then suggest specific times? Um, or are you someone that looks at their calendar, sends them a meeting invite? To be like, if this works great, if it doesn't, let me know. But I'm just going to assume it works because your calendar throws you a screen. Whatever that is for you. He also talks about setting up uh, protocols related to clients or students. So whoever you serve, how do you communicate with them, and how do you manage your expectations and set up your own system to communicate with them consistently? So. Um, do you have a ticket style system? Can you set up sub email accounts to manage different types of communication? Can you communicate through shared platforms like Google Docs? Um, he talks about how it's really helpful if you can be looking at a screen to manage like to do's or something that isn't through email, like the Google Doc. He's a big fan of um, the to do list where you or to do software when you have lists of things. So, Trello, he's a big fan of Trello. Get out of your email and manage what you need to do and how you communicate with people that doesn't have you looking at the rest of your inbox. He also, um, he says for those that work in higher ed, he's a big fan of the office hours, which, you know, he's faculty, that makes sense. But he says we should set up specific times of when people can drop by for unscheduled chats. He gives recommendations of like, if someone's like, hey, do you have time? Just get, yeah, every Tuesday at noon, you can just drop by. He also is a big fan of writing emails that are five sentences or less. And I guess there's like research behind that. And you can like put a link in there, like, here's why I write sentences, emails that are five sentences or less. But he, he challenges himself to like keep his emails short. Okay, last. Yep, okay, last slide. Um, he also talks about when you're doing deep work, you need to consider where you are able to be most focused how long you will focus and what support you need, like coffee or tea. So think about the marathon, like what clothes am I wearing? What are my shoes? So like, what's the environment that you're setting up for yourself in order to engage in that deep work? He also makes a special note that being in deep work doesn't have to be alone. You can be with a partner. Um, 
So like Michael Butcherman and I, we met a few weeks ago to go over a state parking lot and have like a proposal. And both of us put our phones down and then said, we have 60 minutes where we will only talk about this. And we were able to put together a proposal and send it out to where it needed to go. He argues that Cal Newport in general argues that if you train yourself to use your phone less, if you use your email less, if you're looking at screens less, you will train yourself to do more and more or longer and longer deep work. That you will truly have the ability to do the work and not be distracted. We are we are at the end, and I, if we had time for small groups, we would, but we do not. Um, these are these are some these are two quotes that um, just really hit me when I was reading his work: "Treat your time with respect, and then leave good evidence of yourself. Do good work." But I'm curious, just from a large group, how is this part landing on you? Like digital minimalism, whether it's emails, if it's less time on your phone, or um, setting up your own internal processes or protocols where you're not reliant on someone else, but you can manage your workload. Do you if anyone does any of this or how it's laid? I'll speak to it as a student with emails. We don't have a choice with the emails we get as a student. We get them from your office, we get them from the LSC, we get them from the department. This, you know, like really important emails that I need because I'm just constantly having to take 40 emails as a student and I don't live over here. So I'm missing those things. And I think a lot of us have jobs where you're relying on it, you know. So it's hard to set your own. I mean, it sounds like you're able to do that in your office and set your own guidelines, but how do you do that if you don't have that option? I'm only going to answer your emails twice a week. Mm. So hopefully that works for you. You know, like that works for you in your office and you're able to set that as, as kind of leading that that team and setting that precedent. But um, I think the emails just gotten away. I don't know how to just remove it from my life and not miss out on all these other things I think we can. I appreciate that challenge. You have less control, you have less options. One thing that I did, I don't know if this would be helpful. I um, I set up uh, I set up three subfolders in my inbox where certain emails automatically got routed to them. One was any quality document or financial document I needed to sign. Well, it quality is a financial system that we use to manage finances very easily. Two, whenever I think of something that I need to do for myself, I write myself an email and I just put in some really misspelled subject line just like remembering to do something um and so what i started doing is i would write calf colon some 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 and i would route that into its own box so that when i sat down in my email i uh could get out of my inbox and look at the tasks that i had emailed myself like over the last 24 hours and just focus on that then my third one this is where i'm coming back to you and i don't know if it's helpful or not but i get some financial newsletters. Um, I take care of like my parent finances stuff. So I read about different finances at different stages of life. And I didn't like those coming into my inbox. So I routed them into its own inbox or its own folder. And I thought like, oh, well, I'll just go in and read these like, I don't know, one day with every other day. Nope, I went weeks without reading them. So I unsubscribed from it all. I was like, oh, okay, actually I don't need these. And so I would, I would wonder if there's options for are there emails that are coming into your inbox that you can unsubscribe from to just lower the amount or I don't know and I don't that's not getting exact I understand like you don't want to email coming from the president or something. Yeah not every email is going to be asking I get it. It's also being recorded. And so I mean like emails are coming in either I'm help a little bit. Even though you could like specifically just said one if it was like all of your Canvas notifications went into a box yeah. and you could look at all those at once. Yeah. 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 Look up who had it set up the rules. You just can tell it like any email you know, with this subject line has to click, has to go here. And it just never hits your inbox. It's been helpful for me to even see what emails I didn't want. But it helps me to batch all my financial emails.
I think maybe one of my biggest takeaways from the whole thing, um, I mean, it has to do with emails and the rest time and all, all that stuff is finding the balance that works for you. Yeah. Um, taking some of what you talked about and thinking, oh, well, that one, like, that one makes sense for the way I work or whatever. Okay. And, um, you know, maybe just trying to find a way to apply it to your thing, so your workflow or whatever you like. So, like, if it's an email, problem that you're having and organizing your folders is going to just help cut a little bit of the stress out of it um, for you. It's just about like the little things that you can help me put a few of them together and then like kind of just improve everything as a whole. So it's not about like, oh, well, I need to just stop using email all together. Like, that's, I'm going to get rid of them. I'm going to throw my phone out the window. And then it's, it's about like, oh, like I'm, I'm I'm running into this problem and I think this might be to solve it. Um, and testing it out, finding that balance in between um, the quality of user time and social time, that kind of stuff. Um, so like, it's, it's more about finding more work for you and finding the challenges that you face and seeing what might help solve those challenges. Yeah, there's certainly things from the book that I, I don't even mention because I probably read over them and was like, no. But, and then even here, there's like scheduling like office hours. I'll never hold to that in my own work. So I put it up there because it's one of the recommendations that I think is worth mentioning because it can work for some. I know I would never hold myself to those office hours. People are like, are you able to meet? I'm like, yeah. Like, I know, you know, I just know that it would work for me. But so, yes, yeah, so I appreciate that take of like what from Cal Newport does make sense for you, if anything. And what is like, no, that doesn't that doesn't work for my life. And because I'm really structured during the day and I need unstructured that's still working. I think you and I need to get together and throw some ideas because with my staff, there's no way I can have a staff meeting. Mm. Too many and too many shifts. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, if you throw the students in, there's no way. Yeah, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, so how are you communicating ideas? And right now, my only way of getting everybody at the same time to send out a group email. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. I hate doing it. And I, I do bullet points too on my emails. <laughs> so it's a little unclear, but I mean, 50, 60, 70 staff members, depending on the time of year, what do you do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can brainstorm. And I don't know that there is a better way. But yeah, that. My, I'm able to default to say, well, when I see you next in my next one-on-one -on -one or my next staff meeting, but we do have a group staff meeting. So yeah, I have the option to do that in my job. I appreciate that challenge. I'm incredibly appreciative of y'all being here today. Um, thank you for your feedback. Again, it's only my second time doing this. So I'm still learning a lot as I would do this and considering other perspectives or um, not trying to talk about Cal Newport as like the right person, but just like an option. He's been his work has been impactful in how I show up in my work life and my personal life. And so I've been thankful for the opportunity to share with others in case it's impactful as well. So um I do I recommend the world to that email book um for sure. Um and uh he has a podcast. I don't recommend the podcast. Um he his podcast is like he takes in like five or six questions from readers and then just addresses all of them, but they're not consistent. So I find myself like really interested in one question, then like three in a row that I don't care about. And so I don't like that. He writes for the New Yorker if you have a subscription to the New Yorker. I think his writing for the New Yorker are really interesting. They're um, sometimes he's workshopping stuff that will eventually become a book. Like right now, he's doing a lot about slow productivity, but he also will just write short snippets in response to things. And I think it's just a cool condensed version to read his writing and not commit to a whole book. Thank you all. Yeah, that, I get that. I, yeah, I don't think I could do it. I, it, that's a, that's a commitment. But as a faculty member, I get why he's recommending it. It's like a part of his culture. Everybody has all the time. I get that. So. Oops. But I was, I was just um, you should talk to Mo. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I'm going to sit here and work with some of the people. I'm going to sit here and work with some of the people. I'm going to sit here and work with some of the people.
Interesting. It's, it's really cool. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. ABC time. You know, it's funny. I've been